Life is a pretty prominent feature of our planet Earth. As far as we know, nowhere else in the universe life can be found. But all life on this planet has to have come from somewhere. Tracing back our ancestry may reveal important information about where we came from. What can we say about an organism commonly known as LUCA? In 1859, Charles Darwin, after a five-year voyage around the world aboard the HMS Beagle, published his theory of evolution, which claimed animals got random mutations due to the copying of DNA, not always going perfect. Most of the time, these mutations were not helpful, and the animal's chances of survival dropped. But sometimes, a useful mutation came along. A good example of this is the polar bear. During the last ice age, a bear was born with a mutation that gave them a white fur coat. In the colder temperatures, this bear had a higher chance of survival as the white fur blended better with the snowy landscape and gave the bear an evolutionary advantage over the other bears hunting in the snow. The bear passed on its mutation to its offspring, and over time, white bears became the most successful bear species in the Arctic region. This principle is known as survival of the fittest. The polar bears were more fitted for the Arctic environment, and thus became the dominant bear species in the region. This process, whereby organisms better adapted to the environment tend to survive and produce more offspring, is scientifically known as natural selection. And this is how nature guides evolution towards new species. But the polar bear and the brown bear diverse less than half a million years ago. There are now two bear species descended from one species. Half a million years ago, the polar bears and brown bears shared their lost common ancestor. But this is only one of two ways a new species can appear, called sympatric speciation. The other way is allopatric speciation. One of the most famous examples of this is probably Darwin's finches from the Galapagos Islands. Each island is habituated by a different finch species that is specifically adapted to the particular island it's on. Darwin himself found this relation on his journey with the beagle. Probably all these finches have one and the same ancestor, but somewhere in the past, little groups of these finches moved to a neighbour island and became isolated geographically from the other finches. But the habitat on this new island is slightly different. Because of the big distance to the other islands, the finches are only able to reproduce with themselves, with partners on their own island. So after a very long time in which the fittest finches reproduce the most, the finches evolve into another species that is better adapted to this new island. On the tree of life, you can trace back the common ancestor between species. The last common ancestor of chimps and humans lived about 7 million years ago. The last common ancestor of all bird species, which was very probably a dinosaur, lived 210 million years ago. The last common ancestor between humans and frogs lived about 330 million years ago. The further you go back, the more branches converge. 380 million years ago, the last common ancestor of all land organisms lived. 530 million years ago, the last common ancestor of all vertebrate species lived. Plants and animals separated into two branches about 2 billion years ago. If you keep tracing back, you begin to realize that all the branches lead back to one single trunk. Before anything branches, there was one universal common ancestor. Darwin himself already theorized that such a creature once lived. Today, we call this the last universal common ancestor, or LUCA for short. LUCA isn't the first to have lived. Instead, it's the ancestor of everything that's alive today. Even though the suggestion of LUCA's existence was already made back in 1859 by Darwin himself, there wasn't really anything we could learn about it. For a long time, we only had fossils. And the further back in time you go, the harder it is to find fossil evidence. Rocks are eroded and destroyed over time, and so are the fossils they may contain. Right now, the oldest definitive fossils are 3.5 billion year old stromatolites, which are bacterial colonies in Western Australia. On top of that, LUCA lived far before bones evolved, so for a long time we could only speculate about what LUCA could have been, until we developed genomics. Every organism has a distinct genome, which is the genes of the organism. Genes are a distinct sequence of nucleotides, which in turn form a chromosome. They are the units of information which are transferred from a parent to an offspring, and is held to determine some characteristic of the offspring known as phenotypes. Genes are therefore a method of information storage to organisms, forming genotypes. 
The more complex an organism is, the more useful genes it will contain. Humans have 23 chromosomes, each of which contain 500 to 4,000 genes. In 2003, the first human genome was sequenced. It was found that the human genome contained about 3 billion genes. The three domains on the tree of life are eukaryote, which include multicellular and single cellular protists. For example, amoeba, yeast, and algae. Eukaryote means with cell nucleus in Latin, and includes life forms like humans and wombats. Prokaryotes, like E. coli, and archaea. The way archaea differ from bacteria is that the way they create their proteins looks like the way eukaryotes do. In contrast to bacteria, which have their own, more primitive, way of doing it. The point which these three branches converge is where we would find LUCA. Mapping the genomes of the three different creatures and lining them up to find similarities might point to the right direction of what LUCA's genome might have looked like. For example, LUCA likely had a small amount of genes and scientists are therefore looking for the minimal genome, which is the smallest number of genes an organism can have and still survive. According to current research, LUCA probably had around a few hundred genes, which would have provided for a simple metabolism and an RNA-based genome. Bacteria and archaea are both the most distant related life forms on Earth. So if research finds common genes in both of them, this might very well have been inherited from LUCA. Finding all these genes could help to create a rough idea of LUCA's genome. If and when we do unveil Luca's genome, we will know what our primitive common ancestor looked like. Or oh, well, not physically, but at least biochemically. Knowing its complete genome would allow us to make a scientifically accurate reconstruction of Luca, from which we could learn a lot about what the earliest forms of life on Earth would have looked like. Eventually, this may give us a big clue about the origins of life on our planet. Though life did not start with Luca on our planet. The origin of life on Earth, however, goes back way further than Luca. To answer this question, we need to start at the very beginning of our planet, 4.6 billion years ago, at the start of what we call the Hadean Eon, just after our planet had formed. Soon after that, another planet collided with our proto-Earth, which melted the crust and formed the moon. For the next couple of hundred million years, Earth was showered by asteroid debris from the formation of our solar system. The late heavy bombardment. About 4 billion years ago, at the dawn of the Archean Aeon, things had settled down and arose the earliest point life could have formed on Earth. This is what we call the habitability boundary. From fossil evidence, we know life existed as far back as 3.7 billion years ago, which is known as the biosignature boundary, meaning that in the 300 million year gap in between, somewhere, somehow, life found a way. Probably through a still unknown chemical process called abiogenesis, non-living material transformed to become living self-replicating organisms. On the young earth, the hot water was a chemical soup, or what scientists have creatively called primordial soup. In this soup were amino acids, the building blocks of proteins already present and somehow these came together to form simple self-replicating molecules. As long as you have a self-sustaining and self-replicating reaction going, the mechanism of natural selection can already function. Molecules that replicated faster and better than the others became dominant. Likely, one of the first successful self-replicating molecules was RNA, ribonucleic acid, and a simpler form of DNA. And once you get self-replicating molecules governed by natural selection based on improvement, you get evolution. One thing led to another, and as molecules became more complex and better at self-replication, at some point they became alive. LUCA likely was a simple life form, consisting of a membrane surrounding an RNA-based core and a simple metabolism to allow its survival in the harsh, still rather hostile early Earth environment. Nevertheless, it was this harsh and hostile early Earth environment that breathed life into the first primordial organisms, among which LUCA. LUCA became the first in a billion year long line of offspring, leading to all living things today. It's quite fascinating to realize that we all come from the same rudimentary LUCA organism that live far back in such a rough environment. Every organism alive today, every human, every plant, every wombat or microbe, they all came from the same line of LUCA. Billions of years old, millions of species wide. We are all truly related.
This video was made in collaboration with Times Infinity. You can check out his video about genetic engineering over on his channel by following the link on screen right now.